All right, First Timothy for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number four, title of this lesson, Paul's Instructions on Prayer and the Role of Men and Women in the Church. If you're following along in your Bibles, First Timothy chapter two. So in chapter two of this uh, letter, Paul will move from personal encouragement of Timothy by confirming his teaching and the necessity of or disciplining rather false teachers. That's what he talked about last time uh, we met. Uh, he's going to move to instructions concerning prayer and some of the purposes of prayer that he needs to keep in mind. So in this section, Paul will remind Timothy that prayers are to be made for all men so that mankind might come to know the truth and be saved. That's the, uh, the, um, the motivation behind prayer, the basic motivation behind prayer. So for this reason, Paul stresses that prayer is an absolute necessity in the work of bringing the lost to salvation. And then he's going to talk about, you know, linked together with this idea of prayer, the role, the proper role of men and women in the church uh, who are committed to the task of bringing the gospel uh, to the world. So we're going to start with the instructions on prayer and he talks about uh, the types of prayer in the first verse. He says, first of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers Petitions and thanksgivings, we'll stop right there, describes a variety of reasons and objectives that we should strive for in prayer. The first, he says, supplication, some Bibles say entreaties, that's a type of prayer. This means a specific request or a request within a certain situation. Dear God, please help my husband to find a job. That's an entreaty, a specific request about something particular, a supplication or an entreaty. Then he uses the general word prayer, a general word referring to all types of prayers that we make throughout our day. Prayers for the things we need, prayers of adoration, praise, confession of sin, all of those types of, you know, uh, interactions between ourselves and God in prayer uh, fall under this general uh, title of prayer here. The difference between supplication and prayer, uh, we should always pray that our families be saved, that's prayer. A supplication is made that our cousin who has begun to study the Bible eventually obey the gospel, that's an entreaty. It's more specific, okay? Uh, then he mentions uh, intercession, again, some Bibles say petition. This word suggests a more intimate relationship with God, more emotionally involved, if you wish. It's a, it's a pleading or a begging of God without restraint on someone else's behalf. Paul says that the Spirit and Jesus do this for the Christians in Romans chapter eight, verse 27 and verse 34. If you think you have problems, you know, and that maybe God doesn't love you enough or maybe you're not good enough, remember that Jesus himself and the Spirit of God is making an entreaty uh, on your behalf, on my behalf before uh, the Father. Uh, then he mentions, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, he mentions thanksgiving. Well, we know what that is, gratitude, um, gratitude is the first of the heavenly virtues. First of the heavenly virtues is gratitude. Ingratitude is the first step that leads to total ungodliness. That's what Paul says in Romans 1 verse 21. They refuse to give thanks. <laughs> it starts there and then it just, it just cycles all the way down, but it begins there. So cultivating a grateful attitude in prayer and in life leads us to a more peaceful heart and joyful spirit. If you don't know what to pray about, start saying thank you. If you're not sure about what you, you know, start with the easy stuff. Thank you, God, my heart is beating. I am breathing normally. I'm able to walk about. I have eyes that I can see. You know, just start there. It's amazing how many things uh, you can be thankful for if you, you know, if you put your mind to it. Uh, gratitude for what God gives us, as I say, enables us to enjoy our blessings without guilt. You're eating a fine meal, well cooked, boy, there's plenty of it, as much as you wish, and then you, know, you hear on the radio an appeal for people who are starving in some other country. 
oh boy, you know, boy, that just took away all my joy you know, of eating my meal. Why? That you are blessed you know, doesn't mean that somehow you're responsible for someone else's you know, difficulty in another place. If I have abundance, I say thank you God. My mother used to say that, just say thank you. Don't apologize, don't make excuses. If, if something good happens, say thank you and move on. Okay, so he goes from you know, the type of prayers to who we should pray for in the following verses. He says uh, these prayers and petitions and so on and so forth should be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So prayer for all, because salvation for all begins with prayer for all. Now, he mentions even those in authority, kings and rulers. At the time, there was an issue uh, in the church uh, that um, we, was it right to pray for a pagan king? Should we even pray for the emperor? I mean, he's a pagan, you know, it's terrible. He's not a believer. Should we, should we bother to pray for, is that a right thing to do? And so Paul is kind of answering that unsaid question that we see, we don't see the question in the text, but he's giving the answer, yes, we should pray for everyone, beginning with the king and those who are uh, in authority. When our society is at peace and running well, it's easier to proclaim the gospel because the time is tranquil and quiet, there's calm, there's no strife, this is the role of, of, of rulers, isn't it? Whether they believe or not, their role is to maintain order in society. And so we ought to praise that they, pray rather that they succeed in their role so there can be order in society. Whether they're believers or not, their role is always the same. And that Christians can live in godliness and dignity. These words used to describe a Christian state of mind in an environment of quiet and tranquility. When there's peace, when there's no civil war, you know, when there's no anarchy in the country or the place that we're living in, we can live quietly and decently and go about our business, not only our work, but we can go about the work of the church without interference and disruption. Um, although uh, uh, these are best developed in times of peace, uh, they can also be cultivated in times of stress and war, but peace is better. Peace is better. Better for the gospel. Um, we, learn thing, we learn different things during times of trial, but you know, we don't have to do it on purpose to always be you know, in times of trial. Better we shoot for tranquility. And then why should we pray for things? Verses three to seven. Well, first of all, because it's God's will. This is good and acceptable, he says, in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy chapter two, verses three and four. This is God's will. You mean it's okay if I pray for the king? Yes, it's God's will that you pray for the king. God is pleased when this environment is present. And these prayers are offered because it promotes his uh, ultimate goal, which is the saving of all men. God wants everybody to know the truth and be saved, not just the chosen few. He wants the king to be saved and he wants the poorest person to be saved and everybody in between. Also, God's will is worked out with the gospel. So anything that interferes with it, interferes with God's will. He says, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Because there is only one God and manner in which men can be saved, the preaching of the gospel is necessary. So any environment that promotes this, this is pleasing to God. Whether your king is a believer or not, it doesn't matter if there is peace in the country, the work of the Lord can go forward. In verse six, Paul makes a kind of a parenthetical statement reviewing the main points of the gospel message. You know, God's atoning death to redeem, to redeem rather or to pay for our sins. 
Since this letter was semi-public, had to be read in churches, or rather the contents of it had to be taught, um, uh, Paul takes this opportunity to mention the gospel in general terms. Okay. Uh, he uses the word ransom, ransom for all. A ransom is a payment to buy something back. In Christian theology, Jesus is the ransom given to buy back our moral debts to God and thus free us from the cost of death due to our sins. Now this, not the, not, and, and here's where this comes in. Remember, if you remember the introductory lessons, uh, Timothy was struggling with false teachers in that church, the Gnostic teachers. Remember, they, they brought in a different kind of thinking, mixing pagan and uh, 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 Greek uh, philosophical ideas and uh, Jewish ideas and some Christian ideas, and they were mixing all this together to present a new gospel, a super gospel, if you wish. So this is why in this passage here, Paul kind of goes back over and reviews, this is the gospel. Jesus dies for our sins, he pays for our sins. So he's reminding Timothy what the, what the true uh, uh, gospel uh, is, um, and not the, the Gnostic gospel. This is the gospel, okay? But it's, it, he's doing it very subtly. Um, uh, the testimony born at the proper time refers to the many who have proclaimed this message throughout history. The testimony, right? The faith and salvation spoken of by the prophets. They testified way back you know, that the Messiah was coming and when the Messiah would come, this would happen and that would happen. They bore testimony throughout history. The announcement of Christ's deity and His work um, uh, uh, with the apostles. Um, at baptism, God testified at the proper time, right? Jesus' baptism, God testified, this is my son. At the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, God appeared. Jesus appeared in his glorified state, another testimony to his divinity. Uh, at his resurrection, of course, the, the superior uh, proof of his, uh, of his divinity and selection by God. Again, keep, remember I said, keep your eye on the ball. He's always thinking about these Gnostic teachers. He's going over you know, the testimonies that have been given concerning Jesus that are, uh, that are true, that are accurate, that are legitimate. The proclamation of the gospel by the apostles at uh, Pentecost. All of these are all in one line, one consistent line of testimony testifying to the truth of Jesus Christ. So God declared His plan to save man at proper times and events throughout history so that everybody could get the good news. Paul concludes that he has been chosen to be the one of these proclaimers in a very long line of proclaimers about the manner in which God is going to be saving mankind. This is why he says he was chosen to be a preacher, a proclaimer, and an apostle, special messenger. His spiritual goal is to bring the message of the gospel to the non-Jews, in other words, to the Gentiles. And so, unlike the Gnostic teachers, this is the point. It's not written, but it's the point. Unlike the Gnostic teachers, he does not lie. That's why he says, I'm not lying. Why would he say that? Well, because the Gnostic teachers were saying, this Paul, you know, he doesn't get it. This is old school. This is not the correct thing. He's not telling you the whole truth. He's not giving you all the teaching. We've got the teaching. We've got the secret knowledge. So that's why he says here, you know, the, from the, from the very beginning of time, the testimony was made throughout history about Jesus and how He would come and He would resurrect from the dead. And I proclaim this very, I'm, I'm in that long line of proclaimers testifying. And then he says, I'm not lying. In other words, like they are. It's not written there, but the idea is, they're the liars, not me. So unlike the Gnostic teachers, he does not lie, but faithfully, always, always teaches the truth that we're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And his task was to preach that message to the Gentiles. All right, so there's his uh, instruction, if you wish, about prayer. And he goes from prayer to roles of men and women. All right, we'll read verse eight, where he kind of segues into a new thought pattern here. 
He says, therefore, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So verse eight summarizes and climaxes verses one to seven, because the therefore includes everything. If, if all of this is true, therefore, he says, and, and, and everything is true about the proclaimers and the, the ones who testified throughout history, okay? And if it's true that we ought to pray and that God wants us to pray for the kings and so on, if all of this is true, therefore, I want the men in every place to pray. He's getting more specific now about prayer. Not the content of the prayer, but who's doing the prayer. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissensions. So since God wants all to live in quietness and security so that the saving gospel can be preached, we should be busy making all kinds of prayers for people in top positions like kings and everyone else on down. With this in mind, Paul specifies that he wants men, and here's the point. Uh, the word here is uh, not generic. It's not mankind or humans. The Greek word here is for a male, actually for a husband, to lead the prayer. When the types of prayers he mentions in the first chapter are prayed, the men are the ones who should be doing the praying. Now when he says in every place, in every place refers to every place where public worship is offered, since this letter is an instruction to the church, not to the family. And it's meant to direct the ministers in how to conduct church affairs, especially when it gathers publicly. And then, not just any man, not just any male, but only those men, obviously in the church, who could lift up holy hands. Well, lifting hands was the Jewish style of prayer, you know, like this. We pray like this. Some people get on their knees. I mean, those are just styles of prayers or forms of prayers, okay? Paul is more concerned with the man's character than his style of prayer. Holy refers to a person who is pure and undefiled, who's clean. How could a, an immoral brother, how could an immoral brother's prayer be effective on behalf of the congregation? Then he says, um, without wrath or dissension, this refers to one who is not the cause of trouble or division in the church. A person who's constantly creating trouble, a person who's constantly creating division in the church, that man gets up and just by the very fact that he's standing up in front of the church, leading the church in prayer, makes half the church mad <laughs> because you know, there, there's division in that church. So men who lead in prayer have the responsibility to remain pure and peaceful. You know, better to have no prayer than a prayer by one who isn't qualified. The man that prays brings all of our hopes and needs before God in prayer. He should be worthy and prepared to go before the king of glory. If you, go, if you had to go and make a speech uh, uh, and speak, let's say, to the president, whoever the president is, the president of the country in the White House and the vice president is there and the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, other high dignitaries, would you not prepare for that? Would you just go in and wing it? <laughs> I would think you'd spend a little time in preparation, right? So when we go before the king of glory, you know, wouldn't we want to prepare spiritually for that? Now, this brings up the problem of culture versus command. This verse brings up this common point of discussion and sometimes division in the church because in this passage and a few others, the role of women are, uh, is discussed. So in the church, uh, we have uh, several positions on this issue. You know, the role of men, role of women, you know, so on and so forth. Here are the four positions as best as I can summarize them. There's the conservative view. 
Uh, in this uh, view, women do nothing in public worship except sit and listen, uh, both during the worship and the Bible class. Women never speak, period. The mainline position, women help by perhaps preparing the communion, the elements, things like that, and they do participate in Bible class and they do share their ideas in, in, in class, but they don't teach a class, they don't preach sermons, so on and so forth. The progressive view, women pass the communion trays, they lead prayer, they serve as deacons or deaconesses. And then the liberal view, women and men can do all of the ministries, including being elders or deacons or preachers, no difference. A woman can do anything that a man does in the church. Again, I've summarized these, but these are kind of pretty much the four you know, positions that exist. Now what causes the difference is the disagreement over the concepts of culture or command. In other words, what belongs to culture and can be changed as culture evolves and changes, and what belongs to commands which are given by God and not subject to change. For example, uh, today women wear jeans to church, you know? Women wear jeans to church. A hundred years ago, a woman wearing pants to church, let alone jeans, would have been scandalous. Would have never happened. But today, we think, we think nothing of it. There was a time even a few hundred years back that women wore hats to church and many, if you go to, uh, the, to the Caribbean islands, you know, any of the islands in the Caribbean, you go to church there, you'll see that you know, half the women are still, they wear hats, they, wear, they cover their heads in church. Culture changes. Another one, uh, foot washing. Jesus told his disciples to wash each other's feet in John chapter uh, 13. Verses, to, uh, verses five to 15. You know, he's washing their feet and he says to them, if I, your teacher, wash your feet, you should wash each other's feet. Does this mean every time we have communion, we should wash each other's feet? Because after all, they were having the communion, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, and he also said you should wash each other's feet. There are churches that do foot washing. Now in those days, meaning in the first century, foot washing was a sign of hospitality and respect. Since your guests you know, wore sandals and the roads were dirty, washing your guests' feet was a sign of welcome and love and respect, usually performed by the lowest of the slaves in the household, usually a young boy. Today, we have cars, <laughs> we have shoes, we have carpets, we have slippers. The cultural ritual of foot washing is gone, but the meaning behind it remains. We do other things to show our love, to show welcome, respect, humility for others. You know, somebody comes, someone comes and spends the night, perhaps you offer them your own room for their comfort. And you sleep on the couch or you take the guest, you know, that's a small way of showing uh, respect. You give somebody a ride to church. It's a, show, a small way of showing them your love. Jesus taught his apostles to humble themselves and to respect others and to offer hospitality and he used a cultural form of that era, foot washing, to make his point. Now the apostles continued to teach the church to humble itself and love and respect others. You know, Paul taught that in Ephesians 4, 31 to 5, 2, and John in 1 John 4, verse 7. But they did not command foot washing as the way to demonstrate this Christian humility, respect, and love. So they continued the teaching, but they did not demand the form that Jesus used to teach that they understood the difference between a command and a cultural form. Loving each other, hospitality, these were eternal principles that Jesus kind of wrapped up in a first century format. 
foot washing. Today, these things remain. But we have other ways, other cultural forms, if you wish, to practice the eternal principle of love and welcome and hospitality. Another example is baptism. Jesus commanded his disciples to be baptized as a response of faith to the gospel. Yes, we're saved by faith and we express that faith how? Well, we repent, we're baptized. Jesus commanded that, that's a command. Matthew 28, Matthew 16, Acts 2, it just goes on and on. So baptism wasn't invented by Jesus. Baptism was an ancient religious cultural form used not only by Jews but by pagans as well. The pagan natural, uh, nature religions performed a kind of baptism, except you had to be baptized in a rushing stream. You know, the stream had to be moving for you to be baptized because the water was alive, and so on and so forth. The Jews we know also uh, used it as a purification rite. So what does Jesus do? He takes this form and he gives it his meaning. And his meaning is regeneration. Okay. He ties this to the gospel and he commands the apostles to preach this to the world. Again, Matthew 28, Mark 16. And so the apostles preach baptism and they include it in their writings. They command that it remain unchanged as part of the gospel. Galatians 3, 26, 28. This is a religious cultural form that is given by Jesus to keep and it is then confirmed by the apostles' teaching. Acts 2.38, uh, Acts 22.16. You know, by the time Paul is converted, the church has grown, it's, been, it's in existence for many years. What, is, what does Ananias say to Paul? Saul, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So it's not like it was like just a Pentecost thing. They had continued teaching this very thing all the way through for years and it's continued until this day. So this is an enduring command and it remains despite the changes in culture. The foot washing we left behind because culture changed and the apostles did not make a command out of it. Baptism has remained despite cultural changes. Why? Because the apostles commanded it. Not just the meaning, but the form as well. Had the apostles commanded foot washing, we'd be washing feet today, but they didn't. So Jesus commands it, he imposes it on all of those who will become his disciples. Then the apostles teach and preserve this rite in their sacred writings. They teach other Christians and they preach to non-Christians that baptism is a necessary step in the process of becoming a Christian. You know, some people say, well, that was just a Jewish thing for Jews who were going to become Christians. Ah, well, it, you know. Paul demanded that both Jews be baptized and then when he was preaching to Gentiles, well, they had to be baptized too. He didn't make any distinctions there. So this is a command and it's meant to be kept until Jesus returns. What does he say in Ephesians 4, Paul? There's only one baptism, one Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism. So most issues of uh, disagreement between liberals and conservatives crop up when deciding how do we interpret what is command and what is custom. So churches that have women ministers or homosexual ministers or other liberal practices they do so because they consider certain issues simply cultural things that can be changed to suit today's mindset. And the way you kind of decide where you are on the spectrum here, the more things you think are based on culture, like homosexuality, you know, the argument, if you've ever wondered how does a church end up with a practicing homosexual as a minister? How, how does that happen even? You know, the Bible says right there, Romans, you know, how does that happen? Well, it happens because that minister or that church has theologians that uh, teach that Paul, for example, was a product of the first century, of that culture. He was a Jew. Homosexuality, of course, was forbidden by Jews 
And so naturally, when he was converted, he brought this, quote, prejudice with him into his Christian teaching and maintained it in some, in some way. But today we're evolved, you know, we, we understand more things, we're not tied to the culture of the first century. That's the argument, it's called the cultural argument. And so therefore a practicing homosexual who has the skills of public speaking and you know, I'm not saying that that person wouldn't have the, the skills to, to be a minister or a preacher or whatever, says I want to do that. There's no, and, and whatever the Bible says about homosexuality, well, that was just a cultural bias. The problem is, <laughs> when you start taking stuff out of the Bible, <laughs> you can pretty much take anything you don't want out of the Bible. So pretty soon you don't have to be baptized, pretty soon you don't have to repent, pretty soon everybody's saved, pretty soon there's no such thing as hell, you know, any, anything goes. That's how they get there. So the less you think Bible issues are based on culture and more based on commands, well then the more conservative you become because there are less things in the Bible that change with culture or are permitted to change with culture. The answer to that cultural argument, by the way, is that everywhere where the, um, the, um, the teaching concerning homosexuality is found, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, it is always a command and it is always placed as something that is forbidden by God. When something is forbidden by God in one century, it's forbidden by God in the second century or the 21st century or the 50th century. Uh, uh, God says that uh, homosexuality is an abomination. Well, it remains, an, it was an abomination then, it's still an abomination. God doesn't change. God doesn't change. Men change, but God doesn't change. So that the men, I don't want to get too far afield here, so that the men and not the women pray in the church, what is that? Is that culture or is that command? Well, it was a cultural thing for men to be in leadership roles at that time, especially in the Jewish culture. But women, women at that time also served in pagan temples and they took significant leadership roles in Greek temples and Roman temples. So women were involved in religious practice of, of pagan religions. That was part of the culture in those days. The key is to see that Paul's teaching this to the church as a general instruction and this teaching is confirmed in another path, passage with, with even stronger language. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I always go to this when someone says, well, it's not clear. Well, I'll show you where it's clear. It says, the women are to keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak uh, in church. One more passage. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's, oh, 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 oh what's that word? Are the Lord's commandment. Interesting that this letter didn't go to the church at Antioch, you know, it went to the church at Corinth. And Corinth had many Gentiles who had been converted from Greek pagan religions. So it's normal that at, at that church they were having an issue with women wanting to participate in the worship because they had done so in, in worship previously. So Paul was giving a command for the entire church and had the authority to do so because the Lord had commanded him to teach this concerning men and women's role in the assembly. Also, there's no other conflicting teaching on this anywhere in the New Testament. This is what the early church did. So that holy and peace-loving Christian men were to lead in prayer whenever the church met for worship and communion was what Paul taught in the New Testament. It may be tempting to change this in light of different attitudes about women in our culture today. I mean, we have to remember that our first goal is not to appear 
you know, not to appease rather the fashion of today's culture. Our task is to know what God desires and carefully follow that, even when it's not popular. And brother, it is not popular. You think this is, if you're a woman, do you think this is, wow, a little hard to hear? Try being me and preaching this in different places. <laughs> not everybody enjoys hearing it. So what about the women? He said something about the men. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. What about the women? Paul explains how men are to express godliness, holding up holy hands without wrath or dissension. Now he explains how women are to do the very same thing. He says, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Note he says, likewise, in the same manner that men are to comply to God's will, so are the women. He says that, uh, that the women who desire to claim to be godly, they need to do so or not do certain things. Okay. Of course, the things a woman did in order to be godly are the same today as it was then, no different. You know, Jesus uh, charged uh, uh, men with certain things that they had to do um, that don't change. Well, the same thing can be said of women. So both men and women do similar things today to achieve this state. Being honest and kind and righteous, those things have no gender. So this epistle applies to women then as it does to women of our day. Same thing for them, same thing today. So some 2,000 years ago, a Jewish man said that if women want this righteousness label, there are some things that they need to do. First, what are they to look like? He uses the word adorn. They need to cover themselves and surround themselves with things that are good and godly. What are those things? Well, it begins with proper clothing, the word proper here provides the context of this teaching. Clothing that is proper for, for the gathering of the saints. Nothing has changed. Clothing that is proper for the gathering of the saints. Proper in the sense that the clothing is indicative and reflective of other religious and holy women of the era. For example, this is where the veil came in. The veil meant that a woman was self-contained and respected the leadership of her father or her husband. That was the symbolism of the veil. Without the veil, a woman could not freely and easily move about in that society. In the first century, veils were proper to express this truth. Today, they do not do this. That's not how you express that truth today. Today, if a woman wears a veil, she is actually separating herself from the culture. She draws more attention to herself than not. <laughs> the covering, I'm not talking about a scarf now. I'm talking if you're wearing a veil for religious purposes. In those days, you fit in. You could move about and nobody would bother you. Nobody would look at you twice. In our culture, if a woman, usually a Muslim woman, wears a veil in our society, she draws attention to herself. The covering of oneself also spoke to one's attitude, not just clothing. It was the clothing and the attitude together that mirrored a person's true character. So the word and virtue of modesty suggests certain things. First of all, uh, purity and decency not suggestive or sensual. A woman who reveals her body in some immodest way reveals her lack of love for her Christian brothers who may have to struggle with lust and other sins provoked by her immodesty and his weaknesses. After all, love is kind. I remember teaching a, a class of you know, teenagers one, I said, and I said to the young teenage girls that were in that class, if you love your brothers, you'll dress properly if you love them, because love doesn't provoke one to sin. And I said to the boys, and if you love your sisters in Christ, you'll treat them with respect at all times. What you say, how you act, it goes both ways. Modesty also refers to a freedom 
from conceit or pride or vanity. You know, many women spend more time preparing the outside before coming to worship, but very little time preparing the inside. So the word discreet doesn't only mean a person can keep a secret, it means to be sober or serious minded or spiritually minded, not giving to showing off, not ostentatious or frivolous or silly, not overdressed to create a false or puffed up attitude, but also not underdressed to create a false image of poverty or not caring about one's appearance. It means to be mature and reflect that maturity in how we dress, how we live, where we live, how we wear our clothing, how we use our resources. It's all in that word modest. So Paul says that the way to adorn or cover ourselves with modesty and discretion is not by wearing certain clothing or jewelry or the way our hair is fixed. I'd done a little research and uh, about this passage and it seemed that in the church at that time there was an attempt by women to make statements about their position in society by what they wore and also how their hair was done. <laughs> Nothing has changed, has it? <laughs> so Paul is not saying, this is important, Paul is not saying that you can't look nice or you can't have jewelry or get your hair done. He's merely saying that these are not the things that create a sense of modesty and discretion in a Christian woman. He also says that conveying oneself with good deed, or covering ourselves rather with good deeds, this is how a woman achieves true modesty and discretion. Jewels, nice clothing, makeup, hair, uh, these are not wrong because with God all these things are neutral. <laughs> They're neutral. They're neither good nor bad. They're just neutral. But if a woman depends on these things to please God, to be noticed by Him, she'll be disappointed in the end. The point is that God notices and blesses obedience, humility, godliness, modesty. Men and women in the church who practice all those things, they're the ones who are blessed by God and pleasing to God. Now Paul leaves off the idea of how a woman needs to be pleasing to God and moves on to the issue of how women should conduct themselves while learning and worshiping in the assembly which need to be led by men. Nearly done here, let me just finish this off. He says, a woman must quietly receive instructions with entire submissiveness. Here the word quiet refers to one's quiet disposition or tranquil nature, which is a manifestation of a meek and gentle inner life. It's an attitude of mind. It does not mean to keep absolute silence, otherwise how could a woman sing praises to God? Otherwise, how could a woman confess Christ when the time would come for her to confess Christ? Otherwise, how could she say amen to the lesson? Or praise God in any way? So if you take this passage and you, you know, quiet as an absolute, then it, it contradicts other passages. So this word here means learning in a spirit that does not disturb others. Just because a person doesn't teach or lead or say little in class doesn't mean that they're quietly receiving instruction. Quietly receiving instruction is learning in the spirit of gentleness and humility. This spirit will be evident even in a woman who asks questions. Then he talks about submissive. Submissiveness is her outward attitude. Quiet, that's the inward attitude. Submissive, that's her outward attitude. In these circumstances, it would mean that she neither takes on the role of teacher or judges the teacher. Submissive as a student is to learn what is being taught with a mind to apply something to our lives rather than listening to the lesson and judging the ability of the teacher and his knowledge. The point is that a woman is to cultivate an attitude which promotes personal growth in knowledge within her and harmony with others around her. And then in verse 12, it says, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. This is an apposition here, uh, an apposition. A grammatical construction where two words refer to a common thing or person. For example, 
today I pray to the Lord Jesus. Well, Lord and Jesus are two words that refer to the same person. So Paul uses this device, this apposition device, in verse 12 with the words teach and authority. In the Jewish culture, the one who taught had the authority. In regards to women, Paul is saying that a woman is not to exercise control, operation, function. She's not to exercise authority over a brother in the body of Christ when it meets. Now in the church, teaching and preaching involves the exercise of spiritual authority. It did then, it continues to do so today. When there is a mixed assembly, men are to provide the spiritual leadership embodied in the teacher's role. Women can teach, however, they can teach other women, they can share the gospel and teach the unsaved, they teach children. The Bible is silent on women's role in the work world. There's nothing in the Bible that says a woman cannot work. I mean, a woman can become the president of the United States, absolutely, and receive God's blessing for her effort. Because there's no limit on you know, what she can do you know, in society. She chooses to do based on her skills and abilities. This teaching is only for the church and only when the church gathers publicly. Okay? So obeying God in this question against all, all social norms in our culture is very difficult. But men also balked at Jesus' teaching that they were to only have one wife. You know, they say, well, that's a hard teaching for women. You know, be silent, be submissive to, you know, to the leaders in the church, the men. You know, I, I'll do it, but uh, you know, it requires some effort. Well, believe it or not, we, we, rarely, we rarely mention this in this discussion, but men in those days, Christian men, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, they didn't like a certain thing about the, the Christian teaching as well, and that is that men were to have only one wife. <laughs> they didn't like that idea. <laughs> the Jews had, you know, they permitted themselves several wives. They easily divorced one and practiced serial monogamy, you know, just hand her a piece of paper, let her go, go, go get another one. You know. Along comes Jesus and the apostles, and no, 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 no. You have one wife, we go back to the garden. Husband and wife, married for life. They didn't like that. That teaching was not popular among the men. Okay, so there are two reasons why the teaching on the role of women in the church is a command and not a cultural thing. And that's because it is based on two eternal principles, all right? And Paul tells us that, you know, he tells us, you know, let the men pray, let the men be in leadership, the women in the church need to be in submission. Okay, why Paul? Why is that so? Give us a biblical reason. So Paul gives us a biblical reason in the following verses. He says, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So number one reason, why? Well, because God created man first and then women. Man has the primary position in the creation established by God, not society. Society didn't decide this, God decided this. Paul confirms this idea right here in 1 Corinthians 11, verses two and three, I mean in another passage. He says the same thing. In the spiritual body of Christ, all things function according to the spiritual order. All things function according to the divine model, not the secular model. So it's nice when the divine model is mirrored out in our society, that's great. But then when it stops being mirrored in our society, we have to maintain the divine model and it's not so easy when it comes to that. So the church is not like society or the government or corporations. It's a divine thing and it's organized along spiritual lines. So there is God and Christ and man and woman. This is the divine link and order and we reflect that divine order and link in the church. All right. And then he says, women sinned first, verse 14. Eve was deceived into disobedience. Adam was not fooled, he was, he was uh, induced through his feelings for his wife. Because of this deception, God reaffirmed the role of the woman as uh, that of submission to her husband. It wasn't like that in the beginning. In the beginning, he said to both of them, to subdue and to, you know, both of them were captains 
of the creation. But after sin, uh, there would be problems between the two of them. Because of sin, uh, the man would try to use his uh, natural strength to dominate the woman. And the woman would use her natural instinct and complexity to try to overtake the man. So God established the order. In other words, he, he laid down the law, this is the way it's going to be, to maintain order in society and especially in the family. So it was a role that Eve abandoned in her seduction by Satan. She went to him instead of her husband. Her punishment was to be the birthing of children in sorrow and pain meaning that birthing was meant to be a happy thing, but it was turned into a sorrowful and painful moment. This is the idea that helps explain the final verse in verse 15. He says, but women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. So this experience of having children will be turned into a favorable one because of her ultimate salvation. Having and raising children will be painful and dangerous, Paul is saying that here, but because of salvation in Jesus, it'll become a joyful one. How many of you have baptized your own children? What a joyful moment that is. Or you've baptized a grandchild, what a joyful moment that is. So, so Paul is, you know, uh, uh, yes, Paul is talking about you know, parents looking, despite the difficulty of childbirth and raising children, he's, he's pointing their eyes forward that th there'll be a payoff in the future, okay? And why, what will be the payoff? Well, if she continues in this universal life giver role, and she does so with faith and love and purity and modesty and good sense, she'll survive childbearing, and she'll survive raising children and she will also survive death to be raised again when Jesus returns. So he points not just the man, but the woman forward to the salvation that they have in Christ Jesus. So uh, Paul not only uh, explains the divine order and how it's modeled in the church, he also gives the biblical reasons why this is so. Okay? So Paul sets the initial structure of the church by ordering, uh, ordering it along fundamental lines of men and women, establishing the natural and eternal, and here's the key word, commanded and not cultural roles that each man and women should play in the body of Christ. All right, so next time he's going to discuss the structure of organization among the men who are responsible for the leadership. We'll get into the idea of elders and so on and so forth. All right, thank you for your patience. I appreciate you being here.